shared a little bit about um, my business as well as like what I do full time and kind of what I've got going on locally here. So, let me back it up. So my business is Lee G. Klein, so that's ma uh, mainly what I'm gonna be talking to you guys about, but it's gonna be a little bit of kind of everything that I do. Um, so for those of you who are not maybe super familiar with the horse world, a little brief intro to equestrian sports. This barely touches the tip of the iceberg, but I figured it's a good thing to mention. Um, we only see a few different equestrian sports in the Olympics or like mainstream media. So we see like dressage, show jumping and eventing in uh, the Olympics. And then we see thoroughbred racing, very mainstream. Um, and there, but there's a wide variety of sports out there that a lot of people that maybe aren't as involved in the horse world are aware of. And um, the two main disciplines that we typically see are English and Western, but there are others that kind of don't fit into that category. So within those disciplines, there's various sports, and then there's just a ton of different sports that kind of just don't really fit into either specific discipline. So some examples of different equestrian sports that we'll touch a little bit on a few of them. Um, liberty, reining, hunters, equitation, ranch riding, trail racing, western dressage, fox hunting, polo, and mounted shooting, and more. Obviously, I say those things, and anybody who's not a horse person is like, what does that mean? But that's not necessarily the goal of this presentation, but I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little bit of a background of how much there is going on in the horse world so you could kind of understand all of the little crevices within um, and there's just so many different interests so um, a lot of coaching and training methods as well as like horse care methods tend to be quite traditional um, and a lot of times that is kind of how people learn is kind of just hands-on experience and so I bring a little bit of like a different approach to the horse world so about me, I'm from Guilford. I was born and raised here. Um, and I, in Guilford, started um, my career, I suppose you could say, with horses. So now I am a lifelong horsewoman and I ended up attending the University of New Hampshire for equine studies. And I acquired my Bachelor of Science in equine studies with a concentration in equine assisted activities and therapies, um, which was perfect because that was Pretty much the only thing I was interested in so I figured well I'm gonna go to college I might as well find something that fits and UNH luckily was a school that had exactly what I wanted. Um, I have my CTRI and ESMHL certifications through Path International which I'll talk a little bit more about um, coming up. I recently received a full scholarship to mentor under the international equine behaviorist Justin Harrison who's based in the UK so I completed that virtually with her which was a really, really cool opportunity. Um, and I focus on my personal hands-on research of the relationship between horse and human in kind of all of the work that I do um, with kids, with adults, and it just, it varies quite a bit. But uh, my full-time job is working at Granite State Adaptive. Um, so in 2019, after graduating with my degree, I pursued a job as an adaptive and therapeutic riding instructor at a local 501c3 nonprofit. Um, and Granite State Adaptive is. I didn't is, understand that. So hard. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> Siri's always budding. <laughs> uh, and Granite State Adaptive is out of Mirror Lake, New Hampshire, and it's um, an adaptive sports organization. So. I started there to teach the adaptive um, therapeutic riding program, and I'm now the program director. Um, so along with various equine programs that we offer and adaptive biking, we also offer adaptive snow sports at King Pine, and we do have additional sports coming in the future. So my role there now, it kind of started out just as um, you know, a adaptive therapeutic riding instructor and horsemanship instructor. And my role there now is kind of wearing a lot of different hats. I do um, the training and the managing of the horses. I um, teach and do program development for the equine program. Uh, and I'm now also directing the adaptive biking program. So I, I do a lot there. So that's kind of something on the other side of the lake that, uh, that I am always 
you know, offering to people around here or if they have folks over there that might be interested. So our mission at Granite State Adaptive is providing individuals who have a disability the opportunity to develop independence, confidence, life skills, and fitness through participation in sports therapy training and recreational programs. So um, really our main clientele is um, adaptive athletes, so athletes that have physical disabilities, cognitive disabilities, um, but we also work with a wide variety of people, youth, adults, um, we do veterans programs, we have a lot going on there in both the horse aspect as well as other sports. So um, in 2022, I decided to start my own business, Beach Equine, um, because I felt like there was a need for a professional in the local equestrian world that had a little bit of a different background and a little bit of a more progressive approach with both coaching and training. And, um, you know, I had a lot of very traditional experiences growing up in the horse world. And then um, my college career obviously opened a lot of new doors for me. I learned a lot of new information and uh, a lot of science-based research on you know, horses and training and teaching, and then just working in the adaptive and therapeutic setting with horses changed a lot of my um, goals and my intentions and my approach with horses in general, because it's a very different world to see people who are not typically horse folks kind of work with horses for a therapeutic purpose. Um, it, it definitely changes kind of your view as a horse person. Uh, so I specialize in using science-based based methods in my training and coaching. So both working with the horse and working with humans, my goal is really to be science-based and um, you know, kind of focus on the psychology and the biomechanics of everything. So I use positive training methods with horses um, and confidence-building techniques with humans, which paired together tends to be a very perfect storm for you know, the happy, knowledgeable horse and human pair. Um, and that, you know, is whether they're in the saddle or out of the saddle, I, I offer um, coaching for, for kind of both of those things. So my training isn't sport specific, though I have dabbled in a lot, most equestrian sports. Um, my background is mainly in liberty horsemanship with hunter jumpers and um, some dressage and western experience as well. Um, so for horsemen seeking training for their horse or themselves, I will work with any sport, whether they're Western or English, if they're looking for sport specific training, like they want to go out into the show ring for a sport that I don't have a lot of experience with, then I'm not the trainer for them. But if they're looking to, um, improve their partnership and their relationship with their horse, um, and work on the biomechanics and the, you know, emotional and physical side of the sport, then I, you know, I am willing to work with any, anyone from any, any side of the, the horse world. Okay, these folks are keeping me. There we go. So Liberty Horsemanship, uh, my work in equine assisted activities in combination with a deep dive into Liberty training and bridalist riding has transformed my training methods, my appreciation of the horse and my coaching methods. Um, I'll go a little bit into what Liberty Horsemanship is in, in a moment, but essentially it's a sport and type of training in the equestrian world that's very different from the others um, because the goal is to really build a strong relationship with the horse and the human as one um, with no like tack, no ropes, nothing like that. Um, obviously, like in any you know sport or any training with animals there are definitely people out there that maybe go about it a different way and it's not quite as involved in terms of the relationship with the horse but that's how i approach it and i think that that's kind of the the method that very successful liberty trainers have so there's an example of just a very quick clip unfortunately i don't have as much footage from my work as i wish i did and i hope in the future i can kind of get more for things like this but um, because of that, I did add, let me find it. So um, I do have a, a longer video coming up that will show you a really good example of a, a highly trained professional uh, Liberty trainer. So benefits of Liberty training, um, to communicate in Liberty training, you have to understand both 
yourself as well as your horses. And so that means you have to understand your senses and your horse's senses, your thought pattern, your horse's thought pattern, um, how horses learn, how they perceive the environment, um, their energy and kind of how they put off their energy as well as your own, um, as well as their posture, body language and expression. So these are things that you have to not only understand about the horse, but you also have to understand about yourself to be successful um, with Liberty, which is kind of what makes it cool um, because you know you have to definitely be willing to learn a lot about the horse and there are definitely um, ways in the horse world where you can be involved and not really have to learn as much about horse behavior and how they learn and how they think. There are different ways you can get away with not, but in this particular sport, you kind of have to. There's really no way around it. And so for um, people who I coach that have their own horse or people who I work with who don't have a horse but want to learn about horses, I think it's a really, really good way to start. Um, benefits of Liberty training. So like I said, um, you're going to build a really strong connection with the horse and go to the next level of understanding with them if you're doing it correctly and you're approaching it properly. Um, it can really improve their mindset around you and separate you from the predator that they would normally see humans as. Um, obviously, you know, horses know that we're not like them and we're people and we stand on two feet and our eyes are on the front of our heads. So we are predators, that's what they see us as. But this kind of work can really help kind of um, change the association that horses have with us. <clears throat> and it definitely can influence a mutually beneficial partnership, which is kind of my whole goal in what I do is to kind of make, um, whether it be like sport specific or just experiences with horses on the ground or whatever it may be, my goal is kind of to make it mutually beneficial. So making it something that the horse is getting something out of and enjoying. So this, we'll just watch a, a little bit of this. This is a great example of uh, someone who is <coughs> And I think we can probably go without the sound, but um, this is a highly skilled professional Liberty trainer, uh, Dan James, who actually is um, the main person who, who uh, trains horses for a lot of our current films, movies, TV shows, things like that, and does a lot of the training for, for those horses. And so watching this, um, now obviously he's using sticks. The goal here with those is to be an extension of his body language. But if you kind of watch closely, you'll notice that every cue he's giving is um, really directly off of his body language to communicate with these horses. And so the goal with this too is that not only is he he's cueing them and asking them to do certain moves and certain things, but at the same time he's also giving them the space to express. Um, and I think that that's very unique to Liberty. You know, when it's done correctly, that's kind of a more unique aspect to the sport. Yeah, he cued them to be placed there. Yep. And so at, at one point you'll see there's like more more horses join them and they get in a line and they get placed there so they they know the cues as well as kind of the body language that he's giving them. <laughs>
another aspect of liberty training is being able to train the horse to take cues off of your seat and your leg with no other tack and ball. So typically when we see horses ridden, we're seeing bridles, reins, things like that. Um, and so that's another very unique, cool part about, about this type of training. <clears throat> the coolest part about the the training methods too is it's very natural he's not probably does not have them trained to any sort of routine it's just more of um you know the natural flow that they have going um so I might actually move this over here so you guys be able to see it um, so the nature of horses is kind of what plays the biggest role in everything that we do. Um, with them and every everything that I do with them, I suppose I should say, um, because a lot of things that we, we do with horses go against, unfortunately, the nature um, of what they kind of need. So their five senses are extremely heightened um, and that is obviously super beneficial to us when we tap into it the right way. So when we're, um, you know, partnering with horses in any therapeutic setting. It is, you know, of course, horses being used in a therapeutic setting are chosen specifically for their temperament and their training, and they're trained very uh, specifically for that job. But, you know, having extremely heightened senses means that they're really present and really aware of the environment. Um, and so they can pick up on when we're nervous, they can pick up on, on when we're calm, um, they can pick up on all of our emotions because as prey animals, they are designed to read us. Um, and that goes to the next point, you know, they're, they're designed to remain very vigilant of their environment and, and their surroundings um, because they are prey. And, um, you know, they communicate, like I said, with, with liberty, they communicate through their body language, their posture and their phys physical expression with one another. And it's very, very subtle. And so when we are, uh, working with them in any capacity, being able to recognize very subtle signals and kind of mimicking those is how we're gonna best be able to kind of understand their communication and attempt to communicate back as much as we possibly can. Uh, they are known by many people to have what is believed to be a sixth sense uh, of intuition and awareness because their five senses are so heightened, people feel that there's almost another sense that they have that we don't. Um, in terms of just like how they're able to like read energy and kind of um, feel the energy in their environment and that can be really beneficial to people. Um, they're grazers, they should be moving and foraging for 18 plus hours per day. So that just means that, you know, it's one of the natural instincts that we have to consider when we're thinking about working with horses and how that might impact how we work with them. Uh, and they're herd animals, so they're always looking to remain intact with their band and their herd that they accompany. Um, and so that's another thing to think about when we are working with them and, and being able to, you know, understand why they might have trouble separating from their herd or um, kind of understanding different ways in which we can sort of train them to be more confident on their own when they're with people versus, um, you know, when they're with horses and they kind of have a little bit more of a natural confidence about them. Uh, they're very intelligent and emotional beings. They are very stoic as this is maybe a little less known by, you know, uh, the common population is that they are not like super sensitive creatures, though they are to horse people because we all know how they, you know, hurt themselves so easily and get sick so easily, but they're very, very stoic because they're prey animals. They don't want to be perceived as weak or injured. Um, and so a lot of times, um, you know, any injury or illness that they do have can go masked 
for a very long time. So again, just another thing that I kind of take into consideration with with horses and how we can approach training. Um, they're very sensitive to energy and touch. So when we're working with them naturally, very little pressure is needed to ask something of them, maneuver them, etc. cetera. Um, they're constantly communicating in very subtle ways with one another. And so the more subtle that we can get, the more results that we're gonna see because we'll kind of finally be speaking their language a little bit. Um, and just up here, I kind of wanted to have a visual for you guys to be able to see, or especially those of you who are maybe a little less familiar with horses. So the three Fs of basic welfare would be friends, so they're herd, forage, grazing, and being able to eat, um, and freedom, so being able to move. And then these are kind of their natural behaviors that, that we see a lot with them, and I'll kind of get more into that, this being one of them. So this would fit under the category of um, social behavior. So mutual grooming is a natural equine behavior. The social experiences between horses is very important um, because they're herd animals and they form deep connections and bonds. Uh, they deeply connect to all of their herd and band members. So a herd would be a really big group of horses like you might see like on, you know, TV when they're displaying like an example of like feral or wild herds, like you would see a really big herd. Bands would be like a smaller group within that. So like typically what we see at farms like local farms and things like that, you see like maybe two to like six horses that are together in a fenced in area turned out. So that would be more of like a band. Within that, they often develop pair bonds, which is like one horse that they're very closely connected to. Um, and the difference between the pair bond and band and the herd is that with a pair bond, they'll allow them into their like personal bubble. Um, which they typically won't. Like they will stay very close to one another and they'll kind of move along with each other in the same path as their herd and bandmates, but they will allow a pair bond to come into their very small circle, like within two feet. Um, and that often offers room for playing or mutual grooming. So this is an example of mutual grooming when they will kind of groom each other, chew on each other, give each other like a little scratch, a little massage. Um, and that's a really important social behavior that we unfortunately don't see enough of with horses um, today because horses are, are very um, under socialized, unfortunately, with the way that we kind of raise them. They can be, not always, but um, a lot of times they tend to be a little under socialized. So we don't see this as often. But the reason I bring this up is because this is something we can kind of mimic with them. Uh, obviously, it's not, not the same as horse to horse, but. In the picture to the right, you can see that the horse is kind of turning around and sort of doing it to the human a little bit um, because that human is trying to initiate almost like a mutual grooming session, which is uh, a way to kind of facilitate bonding. And I'll just show you a, a little clip of this. Um, this is uh, an example of two horses kind of grooming each other and what that might look like. It's very cute to see. And they will do this, um, you know, just as a bonding activity or, you know, grooming one another. If they're dirty or if it's huggy. They'll also do this in situations, um, research has shown that they'll do this in situations where they need to alleviate stress as well. Um, so they'll kind of go seek one another out for a little bit of stress relief, which is interesting to know because we as trainers or as horse people or as people who want to be around horses i think these things are really important to pay attention to so that we can kind of find ways to um kind of come in as a human and sort of try to mimic that a little bit so that they can see us as a little bit of stress relief um so kind of jumping topics a little bit i'm gonna go a little backwards to what I was talking about in the beginning with my um, certifications and things like that and talk a little more about what exactly I do. So PATH International is the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship um, and it's a highly respected international governing body for adaptive and therapeutic riding and horsemanship organizations. So most um, therapeutic or adaptive riding organizations that you would find would be like PATH certified instructors, um, PATH operating centers or like PATH accredited centers. Um, it's not the only like 
certification process out there for it, but it is kind of like the most well-known currently um, for in terms of internationally. So CTRI is a certified therapeutic riding instructor, um, and that is, again, that's a PATH certification. So this is basically with the goal of teaching riding skills with a strong understanding of um, different disabilities um, and how to kind of teach children, adults, you know, and kind of cover all the bases in terms of cognitive disabilities, um, physical disabilities, visual impairments, anything like that. Um, that that's what this certification covers. It kind of prepares you to work with riders from all backgrounds and understanding how you can adapt your not only your teaching style but also your equipment, your activities, your course uh, choice um, for the benefit of the student. So. ESMHL is um, another certification through PATH that I have, which is the Equine Specialist in Mental Health and Learning. So the goal of this is that I um, would be the Equine Specialist in a therapy session um, with a mental health provider or um, with like an educator for um, equine assisted learning. So this is something that I don't offer over here right now, but this is something that um, we're working to offer at Grand Estate Adaptive when we um, acquire a mental health professional. However, this certification did prepare me to do a lot of other activities with people that are more focused on mental well-being. Um, and so we'll get a little bit more into that in future slides, but that is what ESMHL is. And then a list of kind of some examples of different equine assisted activities would be therapeutic and adaptive riding. So that's what I teach as a CTRI, equine assisted learning. Hippotherapy refers to, it's not uh, specifically riding skills like adaptive riding. Hippotherapy is more treatment based. So this would be with a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, um, and they would be running the session. Typically it is on the horse, not always, but typically it is mounted and they're utilizing the movement of the horse, um, the social experience with the horse and all of the volunteers and um, just like the positive emotions that come from being around the energy of a horse. They're using that to their advantage to kind of like get treatment goals done with clients um, in hypotherapy. And equine assisted wellness kind of just refers to equine experiences that are more focused on the well, well being of the client. Um, and I didn't really get into exactly what equine assisted learning is. So that is, it can go one of two ways. So I offer some equine assisted learning through Granite State Adaptive and it's equine specific assisted learning. There's also equine assisted learning where I could partner with an educator, like a teacher. Um, and we could work on other things partnering with the horse. So for example, like working on counting or spelling or um, social interactions, things like that with an educator and the horse and myself. Um, and we would kind of make activities that are really horsey and really fun to um, kind of get the client involved. So my current offerings through Leech Equine for equestrians, I offer horse training, equestrian coaching, mounted and unmounted. So meaning like riding, rider coaching as well as um, unmounted coaching for riders or people who don't ride who need um, coaching for their handling and things like that, groundwork. Um, equestrian mindfulness, so that is for equestrians specifically, like coaching sessions that are not as focused necessarily on their riding skills, but more so focused on their confidence as a rider. Um, and kind of how they can connect more deeply with their horse and what their horse's thoughts are when they're riding. Um, and equine behavior consulting. So that is a little different from training in the sense where that is more focused on the root cause of behaviors. It's a little bit more clinical. I would be working kind of hand in hand with um, veterinarians and the practitioners that see the horse. And offerings for the general public are all unmounted currently uh, through Leech Equine. There are obviously a mounted options at Grand State Adapted, but through Leech Equine um, in this area, I offer all unmounted programs for both youth and adult, intro to horsemanship lessons, intro to liberty horsemanship, um, and 
and equine assisted wellness programs such as equine partnered mindfulness, grounded groundwork, and enriched equine experiences. So equine behavior consulting, like I said, it's more working directly with owners, managers, trainers to address the root cause of undesirable or problematic behaviors in horses, which kind of the reason I wanted to whip this out is kind of to show all of the necessities that horses do have. And a lot of times they can be unmet, which, you know, as, as people owning and domesticating very, very large animals, obviously any domestic animal, their needs are never going to be fully met because they're domesticated. So their instinctual needs are never going to really get fully met, but obviously we try our best and we do what we can. Um, but because of that, there are sometimes some behaviors that we see with, with horses um, that people want to work on. And so as a behavior consultant, you're looking you know, directly at kind of the root cause rather than how do we train them out of this behavior, more, more so what is causing it and what can we do to kind of shift their management and um, allow for them to have a little bit of a better welfare situation. Um, and so I work uh, with their veterinarians and their practitioners to assess and communicate different issues with the client horse. Horse training is obviously exactly what it sounds like. Um, I will take clients in for horse training uh, where I can do training sessions with them present and they can be there and I can explain what I'm doing as I do it and kind of teach them the training methods because obviously, you know, everybody that is seeking coaching and training is you know, hopefully doing it so that they can improve their relationship with their horse. But I do also have clients who um, I will train for, you know, when they're not present because they don't have the time or they're working on a specific skill with their horse that they want me to uh, refine and things like that. The mindfulness coaching for equestrians, like I said, is more focused on the, the mental aspect of riding. It's very mentally and physically involved. Um, and so, that is kind of more focused on the mental aspect of things, confidence building, things like that, which I think a lot of it does come from just knowledge. So, um, you know, more of an understanding of how their horse learns, being able to feel like they're prepared and how their horse might react in certain situations and how we can really focus on our own mind and thought patterns to become more present and mindful when we're working with our horses to kind of allow for the best experience possible. Mounted equestrian coaching, obviously what it sounds like. So giving riding lessons to um, those who have their own horse uh, at, like I said, at Granite State Adaptive, obviously I do offer mounted riding, uh, but unfortunately over here in this area, I don't have a lesson horse. So that's why all of my mounted opportunities are focused more on folks who do have a horse or they lease a horse or they have a horse they can ride. Um, equestrian coaching unmounted is more focused on the relationship between the handler and the horse and um, you know building the horse's confidence skills and building the horse's skills from the ground up my training methods focus a lot on the ground because I think anything that you can do from the back of your horse you should be able to do from the ground and you should start it from the ground typically um, obviously there are some exceptions for that but for the most part you know we should be starting things when we're not on their back so that when we are on their back and we ask for it, they're able to kind of perform it without the frustration and confusion of, um, of not fully understanding. So for the public, uh, intro horsemanship is something that I offer, so unmounted, but uh, the opportunity to take lessons kind of learning about horses, learning about horse care, really it could be tailored to you know youth or adult and what their specific interests are if they're specifically interested in learning about groundwork um, we would do that if they're specifically interested in learning about horse care um, we would do that and so on intro to liberty horsemanship is um, of course an intro to that specific training method and doing things to um, get somebody ready and prepared to work with a horse at Liberty. Uh, there's obviously a lot of prerequisites before we let the horse off the lead um, and let them be at Liberty. There's a lot of learning to do in terms of your, your body language and your energy and how you kind of are presenting yourself to a horse before uh, they will respond to you at Liberty. But obviously we would go through all of that and intro to Liberty 
sportsmanship lessons. And then equine assisted wellness programs are more so focused on us as people and kind of partnering with the horse to have experiences that are um, kind of more for personal development and self growth and things like that. So equine partnered mindfulness falls under that category. So that is partnering with a horse. I When I do this, I do typically do it at livery. So the horse is um, loose with no pack or anything like that. But the goal isn't to like maneuver them and to train them at liberty and work with them. The goal of equine partnered mindfulness is to um, be like in an experience with a horse where they have the freedom to do what they want to do and they have um, the resources. So I try to set it up so that they have like a food station, a water station, and they're totally at liberty to kind of choose. And then as the client, um, I kind of work through with the client a little bit of uh, grounding techniques to be mindful and present in the environment and kind of really focusing on the horse's behavior and how the environment's impacting the horse and then how it's impacting us and kind of being able to practice those mindfulness techniques and seeing how it changes uh, the way the horse interacts with you. And it's very cool to, to watch. Grounded groundwork is very similar, except the goal of grounded groundwork is actually to be learning and doing a little bit of groundwork with the horse. So groundwork refers to like different training methods and exercises that we do um, off the horse's back for the purpose of their training, but also for the purpose of our training as people. And we're trying to learn about them um, and just kind of that mutual communication. So grounded groundwork is more focused on learning some groundwork, but also doing it in a way where we are um, trying to remain very mindful of how we're interacting with the horse and how their behavior is a reflection of um, our energy. Enriched equine experiences are also really fun. So this is um, kind of just a fun one. This is uh, when we will give the horse uh, like equine enrichment options. So this could be like any scent we can offer an enrichment for any sense whether it be like um, something that is going to induce like some some different movement in the horse or um, like scent work like horses love aromatherapy things like that uh, you know food enrichment like you might do with a dog like these are treat balls and other things like that and we've got like natural obstacles in that other photo things that are going to be like a novel enrichment for a horse um, we would offer that to them and I would do like a learning session on horses senses and their exploratory behaviors and being able to watch them go through that is also very cool so um, future offerings I've been talking to some other professionals in the area and hope in the future to maybe offer some equine experience yoga sessions. Um, I'm going to be partnering with some other organizations in the near future. Um, and I do hold clinics from time to time, which are typically geared towards like horse folk, but um, I'm definitely trying to plan some that are more like open-ended for the public um, to come to. And obviously I would have uh, horses that are, you know, safe and, and, uh, kind for newbies to work with. So those are some things that are coming up. If you want to stay in the loop, I've got my email there as well as my social media tag. I mean, I do have some cards that I can hand out to anybody who's interested. So do we have any questions? Where can you most of your work do? Um, over at Lee Church and Riding Academy in Guilford is where I have my horse, so um, I offer some programming there, but a lot of my work I bounce around to, to different facilities. Yeah. You talked about the senses, the five senses, and like maybe the six sense and all that. Yeah. And in my experience, of course, you know, those senses have sight. Very important to them and hearing. Yes. Uh, but things like taste, touch, and smell. You know, you know, maybe smell would be a good one. Smell of hay or something like that. Mm -hmm. that kind of, do you kind of focus on just the, the main senses? Like, you know, the sight and sound. Can you yeah. do the same? 
Yeah, definitely, like, obviously they're in, more impacted by both, I would say, the two main sensors. But, like, even touch is an important one that I bring up to my clients a lot because, like, you know, the way that they will muscle twitch from a fly, you know, that kind of is a good example of how they can be pretty sensitive to touch and a lot of times, um, you know, we can kind of build them out with our with our experiences of touch and what we expect them to experience. And then with scent, like you mentioned, with the... Um, like kind of smelling things in their environment. Another uh, good example of that too is like when you bring a horse into it, like a show or a new arena or anything like that, if there's like poo piles of other horses, they always want to go around and sniff. And a lot of people don't let them, right? But <laughs> I actually do because I think that it's, um, they can smell actually the, the, um, the sex of the horse. They can smell their health. Like the pheromones allow them to gather so much information that um, it can actually make them feel a lot safer in the environment if they sniff the you know poo piles and they figure out like who was in here and you know like stress levels in, in the hormones that are given off too um, and they smell back off of us as well and then even like you know if you have a horse out and it's windy a lot of horses don't really like the wind and obviously it changes the way things look and sound and things like that when you know leaves are blowing but also like there could be a bear a mile away and if its scent is blowing in the wind and that is caught by the horse there's just so much um more to their senses i guess than there are with ours yeah so i've been looking at some of the reports on um, the electromagnetic field of their heart yeah have you what is your yeah. experience with that because to me that's amazing if a horse is if the depth field can expand to about 15 feet outside of them Mm -hmm. You know, what are your thoughts on that and that, the whole human-horse interaction and the positivity of, of that whole experience? Yeah, so there is some research that is out there, you probably saw, that says, you know, being within a certain distance from horse can lower your heart rate, at which they have uh, generally, a, you know, slower heart rate than us, so, so naturally it would, um, if that were, you know, true. And I definitely believe there's truth to that. I think partially, probably, um, you know what research is showing with the electromagnetic field of their heart um but also i think too just the like the energy of being around them can definitely make a huge difference in your physical status um and i think like you know with the and i guess it definitely depends on the approach and what you're doing with horses right because like it could totally be you know if you're in the city and you're getting on a carriage ride with a horse might be a different story than if you're you know one-on-one -on -one grooming a horse right like those are going to be two different experiences but i think that you know the the way in which horses interact with the world around them too definitely changes how we do um like i was saying with like just their their senses and their um how involved they are in the environment around them it can kind of force you to become more present if you want to kind of tune in with them so yeah, I definitely think that, that there is a lot of truth to that, and I, I'm always interested to see more research that comes out on things like that. Anything else? I'm always impressed by the food things that they do. Try to do any way they can work. But you have to be so consistent. Mm -hmm. and things like that like I want them all to feel 
the safety to express. Because I think when you suppress that, then that's when you start to see undesirable behaviors that people are like, where is this coming from? But you know, when, when you can do work with them where they feel like they're able to kind of express, then you actually have more of an opportunity to communicate with them because you're able to actually get them to feel open enough to do those things and, and liberty, especially in groups like that. It's so cool to see. Yeah. Clicker training? Yes, I do. I do a lot of clicker training, which um, I actually, you know, I started, of course, mainly with dogs doing clicker training. Um, but the more I've done the courses, the more I've realized dogs work as well. So again, one of those things you have to be so consistent. Yeah. Yep. Certain type of training. Yeah. Certain way. Yes, exactly. Anything else? Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome.